My name is Jonathan Finoff. I'm a physician up at Tahoe Orthopedics and Sports Medicine. Uh, I have been doing ultrasound for about the last seven years. I've published a lot of research in this area and I'm involved in a lot of different uh, educational offerings for ultrasound and right now I'll be demonstrating shoulder examination. To start off with the shoulder examination, I paste the, I personally, you can have the patient in a lot of different positions. They could be seated, uh, or they can be uh, lying. I like having people lying down uh, for a number of different reasons. Number one, it's more comfortable for me. I can rest my arm on the patient. I can throw the cord up onto the table, uh, and so it's not as heavy. I don't get as fatigued as I'm doing the examination. And if I do a procedure, I'm typically going to want the person laying down anyway because uh, certainly if you have them seated and they have a vasovagal episode and, and uh, fall, then that's going to be a problem. So I always try to have my patients lying down for procedures. So the first, um, the first structure that we're going to look at is the biceps tendon. So I have the patient with their arm at their side and their palm up, so form in a supinated position. And on the screen here, medial is on the right of the screen, lateral is on the left of the screen. The intertubercular groove is in the middle of the screen with the uh, biceps tendon right there in the intertubercular groove. Sitting over the top of the biceps tendon is the transverse humeral ligament that holds the biceps tendon in the groove. And I'm going to scan down distally. And as I scan down distally, the biceps tendon is going to be diving deeper. And so I have to wag the transducer in order to eliminate anisotropy. I'm going to change the depth uh, in order to ensure that I can still see all of the relevant structures. We're getting down here. Now we have the pec tendon coming in from the right, going across to the left and attaching to the humerus. And at that area, we're going to have the musculotendinous junction of the long head of the biceps. So here's the long head of the biceps muscle right here. Next to it is the short head of the biceps. So if I come back up, long and short head of the biceps, and deep to them is the coracobrachialis. So you always want to scan down to that musculotendinous junction. Now I'm going to scan back up the biceps tendon, keeping it in the middle of my screen. And I'm going to scan right up into the intertubercular groove. I'm going to adjust my depth again because now the biceps tendon has become more superficial. And I'll follow that biceps tendon up around the corner and into its intraarticular portion. So there's the biceps tendon in its intraarticular portion. You can scan that all the way up to the point where you hit the acromion. So that's as high as you can go up into the intraarticular portion of the biceps tendon. Then I'll come back down, center it back in its groove, in the intertubercular groove, and I'll rotate the transducer so that I'm looking at that biceps tendon in a uh, long axis here. Are you go. using a pointer to point to the structures that you're talking about? Okay, good. Will it show up on your phone? Okay, okay so there's the biceps tendon in a long axis right here. I'm going to do a heel toe maneuver in order to flatten it out. And you can glide the transducer distally, holding your the biceps tendon in the middle of the screen, and go all the way down to the musculotendinous junction, which is right down in that area. So there's the musculotendinous junction in the biceps. All right. So after I've looked at it in short and long axis, then I'm going to come back over the intertubercular groove and I'm going to externally rotate while I keep the transducer centered over the top of that biceps tendon and internally rotate and I'm going to look to see if the tendon subluxes or dislocates out of the bicipital groove and his does not. And after I've done that then I'm going to externally rotate and I'm going to move my transducer a little bit medial and uh, yeah just hold your arm right there that's perfect. And uh, coming over the top of that medially is your subscapularis. So there's your subscapularis tendon in the screen right here. I'm going to scan up cephalad along that tendon until I drop off the lesser tuberosity. Now I'm going to scan down caudally all the way to the point where it drops off the inferior aspect of lesser tuberosity. That way I can get the most cephalad portion and the most caudal portion of the subscapularis. And after I've looked at it in long axis, I'm going to turn my transducer, go over the biceps tendon and the bicipital groove. So here's the biceps tendon right here. And then I'll start gliding medially. And you'll see this pyramidal shaped 
bone right here, and that's the lesser tuberosity. And sitting on the cephalad portion of that lesser tuberosity is going to be your subscapularis tendon. So this is the subscapularis tendon right here in short axis. As I come around medially, you'll see all of these different musculotendinous slips. It's because the subscapularis has multiple tendons and interdigitating between those tendons are muscle slips and so it gives it a heterogeneous appearance and that's normal for it. And you want to look for tears. Tears are most commonly found in the cephalad portion right here which is right next to the rotator interval and they usually occur here and then propagate caudally. So you always want to make sure that you look at that cephalad margin of the subscapularis. So after I've looked at the subscapularis, one of the other things that I like to do is move a little bit more medial. I'm going to increase my depth here. And right here is the coracoid process. You can internally and externally rotate the arm. And looking at the subcoracoid bursa, and the subcoracoid bursa sits just superficial to the subscapularis. And uh, so you can look for a subcoracoid bursitis between the coracoid process and the subscapularis. As you internally and externally rotate, look for bunching of tissue and thickening of tissue in that area. So after I've looked in that region, then I'm, I'm going to glide my transducer up and cephalad and go all the way up to the AC joint. And so here's the AC joint. I'm going to adjust my depth again. So lateral is on the left of the screen, medial is on the right of the screen, and the AC joint is right here in the center of the screen. And I'll scan posteriorly and anteriorly so I get the entire extent of the AC joint. And his uh, does not have any significant osteoarthritis or distal clavicular osteolysis or any other significant pathology in that area. You can certainly do traction on the arm and look and see if there's instability. Uh, from an AC joint separation, or you can do a scarf sign, so you can do uh, active maneuvers while you are uh, looking at the AC joints to see if there's any pathology. All right, so roll up onto your left side facing away from me and let your arm drape across your foot, kind of like that. So in this position, just like that, we're going to look at the infraspinatus, and teres minor, you know, the posterior shoulder structures. So I like to start off by looking at the infraspinatus in short axis. So I will palpate the spine of the scapula. And uh, on the screen, by the way, cephalad is going to be on the uh, left of the screen. And the uh, caudal will be on the right of the screen. And I put my transducer so that I'm just uh, over the edge of the spine of the scapula. And uh, the rest of the transducer is inferior to it, or caudal. And that way, I'm looking at <clears throat> the infraspinous fossa. I'm going to just increase my depth here on the screen. So if we're looking on the screen here, this is cephalad over here. This is caudal over in this direction here. This is your spine of the scapula coming down, and there's the infraspinous fossa. And the muscle that sits in the infraspinous fossa, this big muscle right here, is your infraspinatus. And sitting over it in this area, we're getting either... I think we're far enough, no, we're still a little bit medial, so that's going to be the lower aspect of the trapezius. But in that infraspinous fossa, if I keep gliding caudal, you see here that there's a little bit of a prominence in the, um, in the scapular body, and just below that prominence is where the teres minor lives. So the teres minor is here, and the infraspinatus is up here. And that way you can differentiate between the two different muscles in this area. Now I'm going to start gliding laterally, keeping my transducer over the top of the infraspinatus. You can see the infraspinatus tendon right here in the center with muscle on either side of that. We're getting out to the posterior deltoid. We're going to cross the posterior aspect of the glenohumeral joint right here. Now we're going to be over the humeral head. You can see articular cartilage right here. And there is the infraspinatus. I'm going to change my depth. And I'm going to keep scanning out laterally. And I'm wagging the transducer in order to maintain a hyperechoic image going all the way out to its insertion. So there it inserted onto the middle facet of the greater tuberosity. And then you can come back medially. And now I'm going to rotate on it so that I'm in the long axis. So now you can see in the middle of the screen here, 
So your infraspinatus tendon, the muscle is deep to it and superficial to it. We're coming over the posterior glenohumeral joint, and I'm going to scan out laterally, coming over the humeral head, and there's the footprint and the attachment or insertion of the infraspinatus, and you can see it going onto that middle facet of the greater tuberosity there. You always want to make sure that you're not looking at that footprint right like this because you're going to have anisotropy, so you want to heel toe and make sure that you're looking at your fibers that are in their insertion uh, in a perpendicular manner so that you minimize anisotropy and, and don't miscall a tear. So now, what's heel toe? A heel toe maneuver is moving the transducer like this. Wagging is moving the transducer like this. And so, what I do when I'm looking at specific structures, I'll glide to find specific structures, which is moving the transducer either up and down like this or back and forth like this. And once I've found that structure, then I will try to eliminate anisotropy and optimize my image through small manipulations such as wagging or heel towing in order to make sure that my sound wave is perpendicular to the fibers of whatever I'm looking at. Okay. So after I've looked at that infraspinatus, then I'm going to look at the teres minor. So cephalad again is going to be on the left hand side of the screen. Caudal is going to be on the right hand side of the screen. I'm going to increase my depth again so that I can see my body of the scapula. And I'm going to go just a little bit caudal here. And right here is the teres minor. And I'm going to follow that teres minor tendon, which is right here, all the way out in the short axis to its insertion on the inferior facet of the greater tuberosity. So there was the teres minor insertion. And we can also look at that in a long axis. So here I am rotating so that it's long axis. Actually, I'm going to rotate the opposite way. So lateral is going to be on the right of the screen. Medial will be on the left of the screen. So there's my teres minor in long axis. And I'm going to just come out here a little bit lateral. And there's the insertion right there. All right. So after I've looked at the teres minor and infraspinatus, then I'm going to look at the posterior glenohumeral joint. Make sure that my focus is at the correct level here. So here's the posterior aspect. Here's my humeral head. The articular cartilage or hyaline cartilage is the dark uh, line right there. Down here is going to be your glenoid labrum. And deep to that uh, and more medial is going to be your uh, glenoid. And so that's the bony glenoid. You can look at what the labrum looks like scanning cephalad and caudal and also how it looks when you're doing internal and external rotation in the shoulder. So I'm going to get back over that area. I'm going to increase my depth one click here. And then I'm going to externally rotate my shoulder and internally rotate my shoulder. When you externally rotate the shoulder, that can often bring out a, a small effusion. So if somebody has an effusion in the shoulder and you uh, externally rotate, you might be able to see that better than if it's in an internally rotated position. And there's the labrum moving back and forth. All right. So after I've done that, I'm going to move my transducer a little bit caudal and medial, increase the depth slightly. And now I'm over the uh, scapula, the scapular body here, and out here is going to be the glenoid. And as I scan cephalad, I'm going to come to an area where it dips down. So you can see how it dips down right here. This is the spinoglenoid notch. This is where uh, a cyst can occur, called the spinoglenoid notch cyst. And it's often associated with the posterior labral tear. And that cyst will extend into the spinoglenoid notch and it will impinge on the suprascapular nerve, and specifically the branch to the infraspinatus. They, so they can have uh, selective denervation of the infraspinatus when a spinoglenoid notch cyst occurs in this area. Now, you can keep going up, and right here I'm hitting the spine of the scapula. That's what we see right there. And if I keep gliding up, then I go into the supraspinous fossa, where the supraspinatus lives, and here's the suprascapular notch right there. And so in the suprascapular notch, you have the uh, suprascapular nerve 
that uh, can innervate both the, or will innervate the supraspinatus and infraspinatus. And sometimes those cysts from, the, uh, from a posterior uh, glenoid labrum tear can actually extend up through that spinal glenoid notch all the way up to the suprascapular notch. And this suprascapular notch is also where you're going to do a suprascapular nerve block for various pain procedures. All right, very good. So after I've looked at all of those posterior structures in the shoulder, now I'm going to look at uh, the supraspinatus. So I'm going to have the patient put their hand on their hip right here. That extends their shoulder, which pulls the supraspinatus out from underneath the acromion and puts a little bit of tension on it. So this is the modified crass position. And you can see when somebody's in a sideline position and you put them into a modified crass position, that their elbow, because of gravity, will naturally fall back. And this is really nice as opposed to when they're in a seated position, because when somebody's in a seated position, their arm is going to tend to drift forwards. And so the entire time you're examining them, you have to keep repositioning their arm. And so it's really nice that gravity kind of keeps them there and they're in a relaxed position. So <clears throat> the supraspinatus comes out at a 45 degree angle in between the coronal plane and the sagittal plane. So it runs essentially like this. So I'm going to look at the supraspinatus initially in a short axis. And uh, I always like to find my biceps tendon sitting in the bicipital groove first. So my biceps tendon is sitting right down here. This is in the bicipital groove. I'm going to move my transducer slightly posteriorly, adjust my depth a little bit more. So now my biceps tendon is sitting in the anterior aspect of the screen or the right-hand side of the screen. The rest of my transducer is over the greater uh, tuberosity. And as I scan proximally and up over the top of that greater tuberosity, this is the origin of the supraspinatus. So we're looking at the supraspinatus origin right here. And we know that we're looking at the most anterior portion of the supraspinatus specifically because <clears throat> our biceps tendon is right here. So if you have your biceps tendon in the screen and your supraspinatus tendon in the screen, then you know you're at the most anterior margin of that supraspinatus. Now this is clinically relevant because the most common tears that occur in your rotator cuff are in the anterior margin of your supraspinatus. So you always have to be uh, very cognizant of that and uh, scan that area of the supraspinatus. So I will glide that transducer medially until I've scanned the ext entire extent of that supraspinatus in the short axis. And I'll come back towards the footprint and I'll move more posterior. And by the way, just so that people are, under, uh, are aware of this, there are three facets in the greater tuberosity. There's a superior, a middle, and an inferior facet. And when you start scanning this uh, supraspinatus, you can see a point or a bony prominence right there. And that separates the superior and middle facets. The superior facet is purely supraspinatus. The cephalad portion of the middle facet is infraspinatus, supraspinatus overlap. And the caudal portion of that middle facet is just infraspinatus. And then the inferior facet, which is down in this area, that is purely uh, teres minor. But this helps you differentiate between where the supraspinatus is, the supraspinatus infraspinatus overlap, and then just pure infraspinatus, even though there are measurements for that. All right. So after I've looked at this in short axis, and I feel like I've looked at the entire extent of the supraspinatus in short axis, then I'm going to switch to a long axis view. So I like to start off my long axis view over the top of my biceps tendon. So my biceps tendon is right here in the middle of the screen. And uh, if I scan just posterior to that biceps tendon, the first thing that I see with the greater tuberosity is going to be the anterior margin of that supraspinatus. So I'm looking at the anterior margin of my supraspinatus right now, uh, and this is the most common place for tears. And then I will scan posteriorly along that supraspinatus, looking at the ent entire extent of that supraspinatus tendon. Now I'm looking predominantly at the lateral aspect of the supraspinatus right now, so then I will move the transducer a little bit medial, and again I will scan posteriorly looking at the entire extent of the supraspinatus as I scan posteriorly. Now as we're looking at this area, all right, 
just adjusting my focus here. So as we're looking at this, he actually has a very nicely defined bursa right here. This is the subacromial subdeltoid bursal space right in this region here. So that dark line. And there's hyper, a hyperechoic uh, signal above it and below it. That's the peribursal fat, and this dark line is the actual bursa. So this is where somebody would perform a subacromial subdeltoid bursa injection. All right. And you can do a dynamic evaluation for subacromial impingement. So what I do is I come far enough medial that I can get my acromion in the screen, and uh, I can see my uh, supraspinatus here, and then I'm going to have the patient lift up their arm, and you can watch for the greater tuberosity to be buried underneath the acromion, and you look for bunching up of the bursal tissue or any fluid that might be milked out of the bursa as you abduct. All right, very good. So that's the whole shoulder examination. Thank you.